How are we doing today? This is my third time trying to record this, so I'm going to try to breeze through this. Right, this is a video that my friend sent me about a UFO that was seen, that was supposedly seen in Beaver, Utah. What a name for a town. This video, if you have not seen it yet, here it is right now. It's pretty fast. I don't know if you saw that or not, but we are going to go over this right now, and I'm going to give you some pros and cons of what I think this might be, and we are going to analyze this both in video and in Photoshop to take a look at uh, this in detail. We're going to mess with some contrast and some exposure. We're going to zoom in quite a bit. We're going to go frame by frame and try to look at whether or not this is a composite or whether or not this was actually shot in camera and question the size and the distance of it. And I have some insight into this. Let's get into it. Okay, so a little bit on who I am. So I'm a planetarium producer. I make shows for planetariums. So I have a bit, a bit of knowledge of Photoshop, um, the Adobe Suite complex of things, as well as um, 3ds Max, Blender. I can compose things and compile things in After Effects. So when I first saw this video, what I initially thought was that it was a composite because... Let's blow this image up a tad so you can see the entire image here of what I'm talking about. So I want to show you why I initially thought that this was a composite. Because as we <clears throat> as we slowly scrub through this, here we are. As we slowly scrub through this, there it goes. There's our ship right there. And from the remainder of this video, I'm just going to call this a ship because that's what we suppose it's going to be. So we're going to... All right, so I saw this. I slowed it down. And the first thing that popped into my, my mind was, why on earth are the trees not responding to this ship flying past? Why are why is the grass not being affected at all either? Because from what I've seen online, people have been talking about they have located where this is at in Utah, and they can tell how far away this light pole is over here and how far away these ridges, these mountainous ridges are from over here. And they've calculated that this is somewhere between 3.5 to 4 miles away from over where it originated from, which is, let's go back to the beginning of where it's at. Let's zoom into 400% here and let's find, uh, it is going to be, let's see here, there it is. So right there, we can see that little white dot right there and zoom out just a tad. So there it is. So we see this one mountainous region going down this way. We see this one over here going that way. We see this large one up there. So I guess right after the second one there, they're saying that as we step through these frames that we can kind of see it coming and going just like that. See, there it is right there. And uh, advancing one frame, it seems to disappear behind a tree possibly. And then it reappears and then uh, it will uh, eventually go around this little ridge there. Uh, transform into what looks like a banana uh, or a maggot. And then woo, it goes past. All right. So... Um, they calculate that this thing is traveling somewhere between 900 miles an hour to, I think, 12,000 miles an hour. I don't know how they got this number. I have no idea, but uh, I'm going to go with their argument and make this assumption. So, okay, that being said, we have an object here flying past this landscape, and my original argument was that this is a composite because this, if we're going to call her a spaceship, is flying past this landscape, and if it controls, or if it has beings inside, or if it is a radio, radio control or some type of automated vessel of some sort traveling at 12,000 miles an hour, there is no way that this could zoom past these trees without disturbing them. Imagine that you're on the side of a road 
the side of an interstate, you're trying to change a tire that just blew out and a Mack truck flies past you. You're going to feel all that wind rushing past you. Now, I'm not saying that this object here is the size of a Mack truck. What I am saying is, as I roll up my sleeves here to get down to business, is that in order for this object to fly past at 900 miles an hour, to 12,000 miles per hour, it would have to displace the air around it. And that is why when a truck flies past you on the interstate, you feel that gust of wind because it is pushing the air out of the way. And this is why whenever a meteor hits our atmosphere and it begins to burn up, the reason why a meteor ignites and begins to burn up is because the meteor is traveling so fast in between 25,000 to 160,000 miles per hour. As it is traveling that fast, it does not give the air in front of the meteor time to get out of the way. The air is trying to rush past, but it doesn't have time to move. So it gets heated up and it causes friction. And this is what this fireball in the sky this is why we see uh, shooting stars, because the meteors are zipping past so fast that the air lights up due to friction. So, if this thing is traveling at 12,000 miles per hour, it would have to be displacing a bunch of air, right? A lot of air, and it would have to be disturbing the trees and the vegetation on the ground. I don't see why this would not be affecting the trees, or the grass. I mean, we don't even see any movement at all. Furthermore, as we see this uh, this spaceship fly past, it goes right by the drone, which is a DJI Inspire drone. It has a 12 megapixel camera on it. It doesn't even affect the drone whatsoever. Now, I know that drones have stabilizers on them to kind of keep them steady in the wind, but this thing, traveling at 12,000 miles per hour, is flying past the drone and the drone doesn't even know it was there as far as the wind or any disturbance goes. Look, it, it, look, there's no, there's nothing. Furthermore, in addition, we see as this thing flies past, there's no shadow on the ground whatsoever either. Now, if this thing is a large ship, large enough for beans, as some people are saying, with a cockpit right there, some people are saying that this little Shadow. Let's zoom in a bit more so you can see what I'm talking about. Where this little shadowy area right there is supposedly a cockpit. Well, then, if it has beans inside, it should be casting a shadow somewhere on the ground. And if, as I scroll over and over again, you're not going to see any shadows on the ground at all. Now, this is very odd since the sun is going to be up here in this upper right hand corner. We see the shadow of the trees being cast down here. We see the underside of these clouds over here. We see this shadow over here from the clouds above. But oddly enough, we don't see any shadows from this object whatsoever down here, which led me to believe that this was a composite of some sort, though it is currently, I think it's either A, a composite, or B, a much smaller object than what is initially thought. So the reason why I pulled this into Premiere right now is because I want to take a look at some of the things that might prove or disprove that this is a bad, a bad composite. If this is indeed a composite, it is a very good composite. And here's why. Because as we zoom in to the picture, to the image, now this is from the original MOV file that was supplied by the people that were filming this. This is not off of YouTube. This is off what they have supplied on a Google Drive. So we're looking at this at 400%. Now, what I initially wanted to look at when I pulled this into Premiere was if this were a composite, that I'm looking at right here. If this object was made in a different program and then pulled into After Effects and blended together, what I wanted to look at was I wanted to look at the original or the supposed original footage right here and compare it to how this object looks as compared to the rest. Now, let's take a look at this background here. Now, we're not necessarily seeing noise, but we're seeing the pixelation when you zoom this close in. 
So we're seeing this rough gradation of colors. We're seeing this patch of purple with this slight patch of greenish blue. And the gradation uh, between the two colors uh, begins to sort of break down and become a little rough. But this is also what we're seeing in the object here. We're seeing this sort of darkish gray down here, which eventually blends into a lighter gray up top here. So to me, the pixelation and the gradations and hues kind of matches up. So I'm impressed when it comes to that. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because you could make something like this in Blender. Now, this is Blender. Now, whenever I make something in Blender like this, this is a 3D model. Now, I'm not making the entire scene in Blender. What I'm doing is I'm making just the model itself. I will then animate the turn and the motion of the model in in relation to how it's going to be interacting with the scene that I'm putting it into. So if I were sort of moving around a planet like this, I would have the object kind of moving in the same motion as well. The reason why I mention this is because um, when I render this out, I am rendering just this object. I'm not rendering any sky behind it or anything. I'm just rendering this object. So it should not have any type of chromatic aberration when it is rendered uh, because it is not photographed. That being said, I'm going to get out of Blender and I'm going to get back into Premiere because what I want to show you is I'm going to back up a bit. And as I back up, we're going to start seeing this blackish line at the top of the object. And the more we back up, the more this black line will become pronounced. The more I back up, the more we are seeing this black line. Now, this would raise some red flags for me because... If I were to composite this object in from a different footage, from some type of different footage, I would have to go in and then I would have to either recolor this black edge or I would have to erase it to make it blend in better. But if we look up top here at this mountain ridge, we're seeing the same type of black line up top there. Over here, it's a bit of a whitish line. That was kind of what I was looking for in this because this object should be getting light wrapped around it from up on high here. The question is, what if this black line is the object passing through a shadow of a cloud or something, which might be what this is up here. So it's either chromatic aberration, captured in camera or it's uh, either on the object itself or some type of shadow being cast on it. It could be a number of things. I'm not quite sure what it is. But when I first saw this, it kind of raised some suspicions for me. Now people say that this comes from this ridge line back here because like I just showed you, it was kind of disappearing and reappearing. And as it gets to a certain point, you will see that the object begins to take a distinct shape, which is the shape of a banana. It's a little, almost like a comma. It's like it's twisting around. And as it twists around, just like that, and it's twisting around and then we let's take off. And then we can start to see it up close a little bit better. And I don't really see any wings flapping, but then again, it is moving past the frame very quickly. Now, something else I want to point out here too, is if this were a composite, they did a fantastic job with the blur because the blur on the object and the motion blur on the object is different back here than it is as it gets closer to the camera. So it's, it's blurred more right there. It's even more blurred right there because it will be going past the camera. Uh, the perception will be it will be going past the camera faster. The camera's frame rate, which is 60 frames per second, would not be able to freeze the object in motion because it's going too fast for that particular shutter speed. But as, we, as it goes back here, we're not seeing as much motion blur, but it does get more motion blur the closer it gets to the camera. Now, if this was a bad composite, what we would see is a uniform motion blur throughout the entire course or throughout the entire flight of this particular object, which is another point I want to make, kind of make that this is not a composite. Now, 
I want to leave it on this frame here to bring up some adjustments in color. So let's bring up our, I'm going to move this over so you can see what I'm doing here. I am going to adjust the exposure. I'm going to zoom in more, first of all. Let's actually, let's leave it right there. Let's bring up the exposure bit. Oops. Okay. Bring up the exposure tad. Why is it close? Okay. Just bring up the exposure a bit more. Bring up the contrast a lot. Kind of take down the highlights because I want to take down whatever light that is beating down on this object. I want to take that down to kind of see it better. I want to bring the shadows up. So up under here, a bit up. Just want to see what it looks like. Blah, blah, blah. All right. And bring the blacks down. So whenever I adjust these, the black and the white slider, that's the overall black and white and then the highlights and the shadows are the mid-tones. Now if I sharpen it a bunch at this level I'm really just sharpening the pixelation you know not really seeing any sharpening going on with the object that is already blurry but we can kind of see the uh, exaggerated contrast here which isn't really doing us a whole lot of good. Okay. Well. So, um, I did point out that as it gets closer to us, uh, it is being stretched more. So this is not the true shape of the object. It shouldn't be because it's being blurred. It's being captured as it's flying too fast past the camera. So we're getting it sort of elongated. Yeah. You know? I think we've covered what I wanted to cover in Premiere Pro. Let's go into Photoshop and I'm going to kind of look at some things in Photoshop here. Um, you're not going to see everything I do. I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit about what I'm doing here. Just so I can zoom in to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so there's our object right here. I'm going to load in an, an adjustment layer called Threshold. There we go. Now threshold, what this does is it shows the overall relative brightness of a scene. Now I use threshold quite a bit when I'm working in uh, museum stuff. When I'm, I photographed uh, a piece on the wall for a virtual tour, and I need to make sure that the photographed art piece has uniform luminosity over the entire, uh, over the entire image. Uh, it doesn't have any bright spots. Threshold will show you the relative brightness over the entire scene. So I'm going to go all the way over here. And these, this top of the clouds up here, that's the brightest part of our scene so far. And then I'm going to gradually introduce more brightness into the scene. And what we're looking for is how this object, um, how luminous this object is in relation to the ground. It should be as luminous as the ground and as the top of the trees. More so the ground because the top of the trees are very dark and this object, object is very bright. So the object itself should be brighter than the ground. I'm thinking, let's find out. So we're bringing the brightness over. We can see how the brightness is now covering the clouds. We're now seeing the brightness fill upon the ground, fill the ground up. The trees are dark, but now we're now starting to see the object appear right there. So again, here's the entire effect. We can see the brightness encroaching on the mountain range. And then as it approaches the entirety of the object, we're seeing how it brightens up in relation to its background. And to me, this looks correct. This looks right. If it was a bad composite, um, they didn't take into account the difference in luminosity between the two images, right? 
So the reason why I bring this up is because whenever you do a composite in Photoshop or in, in video, you have to look at it in black and white to make sure that it looks correct in black and white, that the images look right when it's in black and white, because you're taking away the hue and the saturation, and you're looking at just the, the luminosity of uh, the black and white image. So here we are in black and white. Now in this image, I can adjust the colors underneath the black and white layer to see, to darken down the blues and the oranges. Reason why we would do this is, be, is because our sky appears very blue and the blue sky should be casting a blue hue on this mountain range as well as the top of this object. The ground down here should be an orangish yellowish color and it should be very different than the rest of the sky and we should be getting a little bit of a I doubt we would be getting a cast on the bottom of this object here, but for example, let's just take down our reds and our yellows and we can see how the ground is being affected, how the light is, how the sky is not being affected because we're affecting just the yellows and the reds, which is in effect the orange. So if we look at our object here, as we adjust our yellow and red sliders, nothing is happening to it, which isn't necessarily out of the ordinary. But whenever we affect our blue slider, which is affecting the sky, we can see how the mountain range is being affected and the sky is being affected, getting darker. But the object itself isn't really. The background is, but the object, in fact, it is very subtly though. To illustrate this point, let's bring up a hue and saturation adjustment. Let's saturate this image. And yeah, we can see that this object is indeed getting a blue cast from the sky because I am oversaturating it. So it is in fact getting a blue cast from the sky. Which is what I was looking for, which again, leads me to believe that this was captured in camera. Okay, so by doing that, I can see that the image corresponds with the overall brightness. It also, or the object uh, corresponds with the overall brightness. It also looks good in black and white. It also um, corresponds and is correctly integrated with the hue and the saturation of the overall image. Okay, so um, I pretty much think that this was captured in camera and not composited in. There are some questions about that, but... Um, Overall, I'm pretty satisfied with how that looked in uh, Photoshop. I'm going to bring this back to the original, um, the original settings here for Spring Park exposure just a tad, <clears throat> just to look at better. Now comes the argument that I don't believe that this is a spaceship being seen here, but so I think, I think this is captured in camera, but I don't think it's a spaceship because my main argument is that this is not affecting the ground below it and it's not casting a shadow. So I don't think that this is a large object because it's not casting a shadow, uh, nor is it affecting the, um, the ground below it from the wind it should be creating. Because if this is traveling as fast as they're saying it's traveling from four miles away, I don't think this thing is shooting past at 12,000 miles per hour. That just doesn't seem quite right to me. I have nothing to prove that with, but um, I don't think that this is a large object. I don't think this is a large object which contains beings because it's not casting a shadow. And I don't think it's a large object because if it were, the trees would be blowing around. around. So again, if you think of a meteor, or if even this was a jet airplane whizzing past, even a small jet airplane, we would see some type of perturbance in those trees and in the grass, and we're not seeing that. So that's my take on it. Um, from looking at it in Premiere and Photoshop, um, I don't think it's a composite. I think it's captured in camera. What it is exactly, I'm not quite sure. Some people have suggested that it is a Gear Falcon, G-Y-R Falcon, a Gear Falcon, which is a almost pure white colored uh, falcon with a darkish underbelly that could explain that black line we saw at the top of the um, of the object uh, the white part of the 
the white if it was a gear falcon and, and it was the the white type of gear falcon um it would definitely be casting or getting that blue hue from the sky that we saw in in photoshop um i'm not necessarily catching the reflections from on the ground on the ground and it would certainly not be affecting the ground beneath it so that is my assessment of uh what this particular object might be I don't think that it is a spaceship at all. I think it is much smaller than what people think it is. Uh, I don't think it is nearly as far away as people think it is. I think it's pretty small. And I think that it, um, I can see it's a bird. I'm not going to say what it is, but uh, I don't think that it is a spacecraft. Sorry, that is my opinion. If it is indeed a spaceship, um, that would be fantastic. That would be really cool. But I don't see it as that at all. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed that. If you agree with me, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. You know, um, I will be checking up on this particular thing as the days and weeks and months go by to see if anyone else has any, any insight on what it is. So enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your life. <laughs>